Good morning, church. After a brief costume change, we're back. Open up your Bibles, if you will. I'm actually going to have you open to the book of Hebrews. And I know that that seems a little weird since we're talking about Ruth this morning, but um, we are, I promise it'll make sense eventually. We're going to get there. All of those uh, baptized this morning, man, we celebrate with you. We love you. I have an opportunity, hopefully after the service, take some pictures and all that stuff. Uh, as, we, as we move forward, if you do not have a handout of your notes or if you're watching online later, you can always go to the Bible app and just open up live events, 35016, uh, if your area code, uh, if you need to put that in there, I'm sorry, zip code, if you need to put that in there. So we have been talking for the last few weeks about the bloodline of Jesus and, and looking more specifically at the characters, uh, the female characters that are listed in Matthew chapter 1 as being in the bloodline of of Christ. One of the things that we noticed is that it's really interesting, not just uh, with the the females, but with everybody in in Jesus' line, there are some very imperfect people. There are some downright scoundrels uh, in certain parts of it. And And you're looking, you're going, wow, God has a redemptive story that moves through his sovereign plan. God God doesn't want to leave things the way that they are. He wants us to become new. He wants to move our story to a new and better place. And so uh, this morning, what I really want us to, to focus on as individuals, as a church, is to say, how can God, God's redeeming plan, work in the middle of my mess? Right? Does anyone in here make a mess? Okay, yeah, right. So there's, yeah, you definitely raise your hand, Charlotte. Um, right, there's, we, we, we all have a tendency to do that. My, um, uh, my bedroom is, I feel like I can keep the rest of my house relatively like non-hoarders clean. You know what I mean? Like I could do that enough that if people, but my bedroom, for some reason, I don't know why, there's just, and it's not like, there's not like, there's nothing dead in there. Don't worry about that. I'm not, don't, it's not weird, right? But it's just like clothes everywhere and my stuff everywhere. And then I'll clean off my nightstand and I'm like, all right, it's clean. I'm going to keep it clean. Two days later, there's stuff all over my nightstand again. I'm like, man, receipts and change and all that stuff. I'm a mess maker. And I'm that way in my life sometimes. Usually it's because I'm trying to take control. I'm trying to be the one to make the decisions and to, and to do all the things. And God's like, hey, remember me, right? So I have a tendency then to go off in an interesting direction. We see some of that through some of these characters that we're gonna be talking about that we're, we're taking their story and we're seeing what is God trying to teach us through their story. So this isn't so much of, a, of an education, let's walk through the story of Ruth and figure out everything that's, that's happened, but what can we What can we we pull from her story that can help us as Christ followers to understand God's love for us, to understand what God expects of us? So um, what what I wanted to do first is just to give us just a brief overview of the story of Ruth. That's a whole book of the Bible, okay? So sit back. I'm just kidding. It's only going to take me like a minute because it really is a short overview. Now, there is a lot that goes on in the book of Ruth. If you have never looked, read, studied the book of Ruth, I want to challenge you. Please do that because there's so much in here and there's so much that we're not going to be able to get to um, because we're only trying to look at Ruth and Ruth's story and and figuring out through her character and and what uh, the Bible tells us about her, how we can dig a little deeper. But there's plenty of other things about uh, family and about loyalty. Uh, there's, there's, oh, it's, a, it's a wonderful love story. Anybody who's into love stories is one of the best love stories in the Bible. So what happens is there's kind of some, some main characters at the beginning. Uh, Elimelech and his wife, Naomi. Now, some people have called this, they say it should be called the book of Naomi because most of this is from her vantage point and her point of view. But um, Elimelech and his wife, Naomi, they are uh, from Israel, uh, but they are forced out by a famine 
and they move to this place called a country of, of Moab. Now they get there, and Elimelech, that's going to be a tough name for me today, guys, Elimelech passes away. He dies. So she, Naomi, is left there. She has two sons. Now again, remember, in this culture, ladies, we love you. We respect you. We believe that you are equal with men. Not the case back then, okay? So they, they, that was not what was happening here. She, she, uh, her husband died, and so now it's really her son's responsibility to take care of, of her. And so what happens is uh, her, her two sons marry two Moabite girls. Orpah, who I will call Oprah before this thing is over. Orpah, okay, different name, O-R-P-A-H. Orpah and Ruth. So the, the sons marry these Moabite women, uh, and then all of a sudden, both the sons die. Okay, so we're talking tragedy upon tragedy here. Right now, she has moved to this new country. Of course, she was kind of forced to do that with her husband, lost her husband. Now she's lost both of her sons, and now we have three widowed women who are kind of stuck. Because again, options are limited, right? For ladies in this society, they can't work uh, and the only real way to make money is ways you're not really supposed to make money, right? So they, they're, they're left in this kind of awkward stage. Orpah decides now um, that she is going to go back to her family. Naomi says, look, I'm, you guys don't have to stay here with me. I get it. This is a bad situation. You can go back to your homeland and just you can, you know, be with your family. But Ruth says no. This is where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay, right? Your people will be my people. It's a great, it's a great relationship that starts there. So Ruth decides that she's going to stay with them, and they journey to a little place called Bethlehem, right? right? This is going to be a Christmas sermon by the time we're done. So the, the, the story of love and devotion tells of Ruth eventually moving uh, to, to marry uh, a wealthy man named Boaz, and, um, and he takes care of her, he takes care of, um, he, uh, he takes care of Naomi, and there, it's, just, it's a beautiful story in how it transitions, but there's this whole portion really in the middle where you just don't know what's going to happen, and, and there are a lot of things that have to line up properly, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Matter of fact, interesting thing is Ruth bears a son, Obed, who becomes the grandfather of King David, so we've got there, she, she really fits right into, that, right into that line. And so what we're going to do this morning is look at just a couple things from Ruth, and then we're going to look at how we can apply that. So if you have your notes, take them out. Um, in, your, uh, in your Bible, we're going to get there in just one second, but I want to work through the stuff with, uh, with Ruth first. Ruth and Naomi find themselves in a difficult place, right? They're, they're in a tough spot. They can't take care of themselves, and everyone who can take care of them has now passed away. And so we see God intervene and offer help. How does he do that? Well, in the story, one of the ways that uh, Ruth and Naomi are able to eat has something to do with the law of the harvest. Again, I'd love to go into all that. We don't have time to do that. But one of the things that God uh, tells his people to do is to leave some of the harvest for those who are needy. So that there are, so that, and, and for those who are travelers when they come through, this, so that they can actually find something to eat. Talk about a different way of thinking about things, right? Leave it. Don't, we don't have to glean all of it. We can, we can actually leave some for other people. Leviticus, Leviticus 19, let me just read it to you. Uh, you don't have to turn there. It says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest, which is the stuff that you drop, and you shall not glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape from your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God, okay? Again, God intervening here saying, this is how I want you to care for those that are in need, that have less than. And what happens is Ruth ends up going to the fields and gleaning at the fields of this guy named Boaz, and she catches his attention. Now, in the in the society that uh, we're, we're talking about here, we talked last week when we were, or a couple weeks ago, actually, I guess, we were talking about Tamar, the idea that um, 
brothers-in-laws and, and when, you're, when a husband dies, if there's a responsibility in that family to provide for that woman to get remarried to a different child. And in this story, we're introduced to, to kind of uh, someone that is called a kinsman redeemer. And I want to, I want to explain that real fast uh, before, we, before we dive into the point here, just because that's really important to this story. The kinsman redeemer is a male relative who, according to various laws um, in the Pentateuch, had the privilege or the responsibility to act on behalf of a relative who is in trouble, danger, or in need. Okay, so that idea of kinsman redeemer, it designates one who delivers or rescues or redeems a property or a person. So, Ruth is able to meet uh, Boaz. They end up kind of liking each other, which is a good thing. But then there's a problem. He, as, Bo as in Boaz, is not the first in line to be the kinsman redeemer. Right? Rut row, Rorge. This is, that's, like a, that's, a, that's a love triangle, which we call no love, no bueno, right? As, so we don't know what's going on here. So what uh, Boaz does is he goes to the, the first guy in line and he says, hey, there's, there's this land that, this, that they have. And if you become the kinsman redeemer, you, get, you can have the land. The guy's like, oh, that sounds, seems like a good idea. He's like, oh, but if you do that, you also have to marry this girl named Ruth. And he was like, Burr. What? I'm sorry? Excuse me? No, no, no. I didn't sign on for that. I signed on for the land. And so he decided, you know what? I don't, I don't want to put myself in a place where my estate might be having to split between other people. So he says, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to be the kinsman redeemer. You can. Now, I think Boaz was using a little trickery here, which I kind of like about him, right? Because he likes the girl and he wants to, he's like, hey, here's some land. But if not, I could totally do it if you don't want to, right? It's just, I mean, I'll sacrifice for you if this is the way that you, the way that you decide to go. So there's this complication uh, that ends up getting in the way, but, but, but Boaz overcomes and, and Ruth becomes his wife. What I love about this rescue is that there's no miracle. You know, there's no like miraculous healing. There's no like huge ridiculous situation. It's just God working through the already established laws that he set up in Leviticus for how to care for people. I, I, I enjoy that. I think it's like, man, sometimes we're, all, we're looking for our rescue to be some sort of a, some sort of a earth-shattering vision in the sky when God's just saying, I've, I've already told you. Like, I've already told you. You have the answer. Sometimes it's just that quiet, small, still whisper. So that gives us kind of an idea of what's been happening with Ruth. And so we see that through her life. Now, there's so much more. I'd love for you to dig into her story, and you'll be able to see all the intricacies of that. But what can we learn from that? Number one in your outline, I think, is this, that God is present in our most desperate circumstances. God is present in our most desperate circumstances. You look at the situation that Ruth and her mother-in-law and at the time her sister-in-law were standing in when they were in Moab, that is not, that's desperate. They had nowhere to go. They had nowhere to turn. They had nothing to, to fall back on. And yet, we see God make a way. Hebrews chapter 13, uh, verse 5 says this, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, now back, quoting back to the, to the Old Testament, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Here we see that there's a, there's a quote coming from the Old Testament. Sometimes it seems like our, our circumstances are overwhelming. Yes, I'm not, I can't be the only one in the room, right? It seems like our circumstances are just going to be overwhelming to us. God doesn't just provide for our needs. Sometimes I feel like we look to God like some sort of a genie in the sky type situation, right? If I pray the right prayer, if I give the right amount of money, if I go to church the right amount of times, then I'm going to put the right amount in the machine and I'm going to I'm gonna get what I want out of it. And that's not... That's not the promise that God gives us. God tells us that I'm gonna give you more even than just providing for your circumstances. I'm gonna give you my presence. 
The author of Hebrews, which we don't know 100%, I think it's probably Paul, but that's just my opinion. We don't know 100% because they don't let us know who it is, but the author of Hebrews quotes from the Old Testament here when he says, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. That's a promise that we need to grab onto this morning. That we need to understand that no matter how bad it looks, no matter how bad it feels, no matter how bad it is, we have been given the promise, the promise of presence. And God does not always say our situation is going to change, but he always says, I will be with you. I will walk with you. You don't have to search for me. I am there in the middle of it. And I know sometimes that can feel empty because you're like, great, thanks. Okay, now there's two of us that feel like we're drowning, right? But God never feels like he's drowning. That's why he says, cast your cares upon me because my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Let me help you, right? Anybody seen the movie? Help me help you, right? Help me help you. This is what I'm here for. I am here to love, to be honored. When God gave this promise, he gave it to Joshua uh, in, originally, and the children of Israel, they were about to take the promised land. And they believed it. And what happened? The walls came. No, top of the land down, right? There's a couple of you know the song, Right? They fit the battle of Jericho, and, and God showed up in a mighty way. God is there with us. God gave us that promise to hold on to, that even in the worst, maybe you're walking through right now what you feel like is the worst. Can I tell you a promise from Scripture? God is there. He's not going anywhere. And if you take a moment to reach out in the, in the violence of your circumstances and just listen I promise you, the peace of Christ, which passes all understanding, he will give it to us if we've trusted in him as our savior. Number two, God offers hope in the midst of our brokenness. So we see a desperate situation. We see that God is present, but he's not just there. He also offers hope to Ruth and to Naomi. John 3, 16 through 17, probably some of the most known and quoted scripture On the planet, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 17, not as many people know, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So in the middle of our brokenness, at the worst of our worst, God says, not only am I going to be with you, I'm going to give you hope. I'm going to give you hope that passes all understanding. For Ruth, this was, the, this was food that was given. This was the um, kinsman redeemer in Boaz that was given that was allowing them to move towards a place of hope. For us, that hope is found in Jesus and Jesus alone. Our hope needs to be found in Christ Jesus alone. Jesus literally bought our redemption on the cross. You see, this is a shadow in this story of what happens with Boaz, how he purchases this land and agrees to become the kinsman redeemer. I'm gonna redeem the land. I'm gonna redeem the person that comes with the land. This is, Jesus did that for us, took upon himself the price that needed to be paid, and he paid it. Have you ever tried putting like anything back together that you broke at home? Maybe there are some of you people that can do that, but I can't. Uh, I know, shocking. I really, I I can't do do that. But especially if it's it's like glassware or something, you know, you're like, oh, I really like this, but you can never find all the little pieces and it always starts springing a leak or whatever it is. And I, I... I feel that way about my life sometimes, right? When it's impossible for me to put myself back together. We can't repair ourselves any more than that shattered bowl or that shattered cup can can repair itself. And when we try to think that we can is when we really start running into some, some theological difficulty with who is God and who am I and where is God on my priorityness, but the, uh, pr- priority level. But the, the beautiful part about that is that we might be that broken piece that's laying on the floor that has no ability to put itself back together. But the potter comes and picks us up and makes us something new. 
That's why we need a savior. We need Jesus to come into our lives, to scoop up the pieces, and to put us back together again. And until we get to a place where we're, where we, where we're able to admit that, not just be like, hey, Jesus, you're really convenient over here. Like, I want you to be, conv- I want you, when you're convenient to me, I'll use you for this, Jesus. No. We have to get to a place where we say, I'm literally in pieces. There's nothing that I can do to fix that. Only you can. That's when we come to a place of understanding what redemption really means. That's when we come to a place of understanding what Jesus has really done for us, how amazing it is, what the cost really is. Only God restores us. He is the only one who has the power and the know-how to fix what's broken. This morning, are you trying to fix what's broken? I know there, there are some of us in here, there are, there are fixers and there are wallowers, right? There are people that we wallow in it and we're like, oh, woe is me. <clears throat> and then there's people that are always trying to fix it. I'm just, just tell me what it is and I'll fix it. Just tell me what it is and I'll fix it, right? We've got to move away from all of that and say, I need to trust in the only one who can restore what is broken. Last one, number three. God rescues us from our wreckage. He rescues us from our wreckage. Romans chapter five, verses six through eight. If you want to turn there, it says, for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a person one would dare even to die. But God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I think what we need to pull away from this this morning is that nothing is too broken for God to fix. So maybe you're sitting there, you go, Pastor, that's true, but you don't know the things that I've done. You're right. God does, and Jesus has already died on a cross to forgive them. Pastor, you don't know how messed up my marriage is. Pastor, you don't know the things that I'm struggling with. You don't know the things that those that are close to me are struggling with. I need to say that this morning. Nothing is too broken for God to fix. We live in a, in a society where everything's kind of, like we, throw, we, don't, we don't fix stuff anymore, right? We just throw, we're just like, oh, I'll just buy a new one. I'm totally guilty of that. <laughs> Rachel's like, you just need to change the batteries. I'm like, no, it's fine. I'll just buy another one. I don't want to do it. I don't want to deal with it, right? We, don't, we, we get into that place, and so we, we translate that to God, and we say, God, I, I'm, I'm so broken, you couldn't fix me. So then we start thinking about ourselves as, as unfixable. And you know what that makes us start to do? It starts to believe it, which makes us continue to act like it, which makes us feel like we have justification to continue to be broken. Circular reasoning here, right? We end up back in the same place, crazy cycle. God has so much more intended for us. Nothing is too broken for God to fix. God is not going to waste our pain, our rejection, our wreckage, all that stuff that's there. I'm not saying that God caused that to happen, but I am saying this morning that God can use every bit of it for his glory, for his honor, to put you back together again. He uses those things to bring about his plan. That's what the story of Ruth tells us. No matter how broken things look, God will sovereignly enter that situation and he will use those things to bring about his plan. Why do we see Ruth in the middle of the story? Because of her obedience. We see her faithfulness, her obedience, her her, uh, love for God and for her mother-in-law that bring her into this place where God is able to use and bless and even put her in the very line of Jesus. If all that's true, then our challenge is to rise from the wreckage, just like Ruth, to be able to look at our life and say, I know there's been difficulty, I know that there's frustration, but we can rise from that so that our lives will give testimony that draws others to Jesus. So that our lives can be something, again, we don't pick ourselves up out of the ashes. We say, Jesus, I need you. I submit, I humbly ask you, fix me. I can't fix me. And then as he puts us back together, we look different than we did before. Right? We're, we're less 
we're less of an art piece, we're more of a mirror reflecting who Jesus is. I was talking with somebody about this the, the other day. I mean, at the end of my life, I hope that people will remember Jesus. Truly, I hope that people will remember Jesus so that one day I could stand in front of him and I could say, hey, whatever it was, whatever good came about was done for your glory and in your name. Today, we can choose to no longer sit on the sidelines of self-pity. We can choose to stop trying to fix all of our own problems. And we can realize that God is asking us to choose to no longer sit, to no longer allow ourselves in the midst of that, but to be, uh, to be able to rise, to pray, to praise, so that God can position me, so that I can shine for his glory so that I can be a part of his will, so that I can move his story forward. Because all of history is his story. Let him use you, church, this morning. Listen, nothing, nothing, this, we cannot leave here without remembering that God is present no matter how bad things seem, God is present in it, that God gives us hope in the middle of it, and that God can fix it. Every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. It was a great opportunity today with baptism to be able to stand and reflect. And say, man, we're talking about new life. Not that new life happens in the, in the waters of baptism, but that that's a representation for those who have experienced the new life of Jesus. Maybe today you're saying, look, I've never trusted Christ as Savior. And this, this whole thing about baptism and deciding to follow Jesus, I haven't decided to follow Jesus. I want to tell you this morning that there's no other place that God wants you to be than right here so that you can hear a message from him that he loves you just the way that you are without having to clean yourself up or become something that you're not or change the wreckage of your past to look different so that you feel like you're more acceptable to him. That's not, that's not what God does. He looks at us in the midst of our sin and he says, I love you. And so our response, have we said, Jesus, I believe you. I trust you. Save me. That's all that it takes. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. So there's not a special event that has to happen or any of those different types of things. We just reach out and receive the gift that Jesus has already paid for. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed. Maybe you're here this morning, you say, you know what? I haven't trusted that God. But this morning I want to. This morning I want to. I'm not gonna call you out. I'm not gonna make you come forward or anything like that. I'm just gonna pray. If that describes you this morning, you say, you know what, I haven't trusted Christ, but man, I want to trust Christ today. Just pop your hand up real fast. Nobody's looking around. I promise they won't, we won't call you out. Amen. Maybe you're at home and that's your story as you watch this after. I'm going to invite you just to pray. Prayer is very simple. It's not magical. It's just a prayer of surrender that says, God, I believe you died for me. Jesus, please save me. Pray along with me, something like this. Jesus, I believe that you lived a perfect life and that you died on the cross for me, for my sins, for all sin. And I know I've never allowed you to lead before, but today I ask that you would save me, that you would separate my sin from me, that you would forgive me, that God, you would help me to follow hard after you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Keep our heads bowed, our eyes closed. Maybe we're here this morning and say, you know what? I'm a Christ follower. I know Jesus, but I have allowed the wreckage of my life to make me feel unfixable. I allowed myself to sit broken and unused simply because 
I haven't asked Jesus to fix me. I haven't asked, I haven't relied on the power of God to fix what's broken. So today, I want to make a decision. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to follow hard after Christ, and I'm going to help, I'm going to ask him to be the one to fix my heart, to be the one to fix what's broken. If that's you here this, this morning, no one's looking around, just pop your hand up. I'm going to pray over us. Amen. Amen. Let me pray over those. Jesus, for us as a church, I know we all struggle with this from time to time. Some of us struggle with it all the time. We read in the story of Ruth about how you are present, about how you give hope, and about how only you can fix what's broken. And so God, help us as your followers to stop trying to fix everything and to just try to be obedient, to stop worrying and to rest in hope, and to stop expecting our circumstances to change and always understanding that you are there with us. God, we pray that you would be honored and glorified as we, even as we go from this place today, that we would be able to bring that light to those who are far from you. Thank you for what you've done, Jesus. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and stand with us to sing.